The uh, Mercedes-Benz interview of the day is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz, the uh, EV. Owning a Mercedes-Benz EV isn't just extraordinary, it's extra easy. The vehicle's all electric, the feeling all Mercedes. The choice is all yours. Learn more at mbusa.com slash EQ. Matt Miller, ESPN NFL draft analyst. He will be all over ESPN shows leading up to the draft. His uh, top 50 prospects came out uh, this week on ESPN.com. Uh, Matt, thanks for joining us. Let me start with Caleb Williams. Uh, was it pandering yesterday to the Chicago media? Felt like Caleb said everything that a Chicago Bear fan would want to hear. I don't know if it was pandering, or but maybe just him finally having his own voice, Dan, because I don't know how much you are on social media, probably a healthy amount compared to the rest of us, but social media for the last three months has been Caleb Williams wants private equity stakes in whichever team is drafted. Caleb Williams doesn't want to be a Chicago Bear. Every Everyone, seemingly, uh, even though no one would put their name on it, everyone had a voice for Caleb Williams, except for Caleb Williams. So I actually think he did a good job of coming out and saying, man, I don't care where I'm drafted. I'm not going to Eli Manning this. I'm not going to John Elway this. I respect the process that is the NFL draft. If it's the Chicago Bears, you know, I'll go to the home of Deep Dish Pizza and Michael Jordan. <laughs> and if it's not the Chicago Bears, like, I'll go to Washington, where I'm from. You know, I, I feel like he he did approach it the right way. And, you know, I, I respect that he waited to get his voice out there until this moment because he could have been pushing back in November, December, January, February. Now we get to the combine and he says, all right, it's, it's business time. I'll, I'll finally put these rumors to rest. Okay. Why did these rumors get circulated to begin with? I know I, it's every year though. Uh, I, it's every single year. You know, it was Joe Burrow doesn't want to play for the Cincinnati Bengals, and Joe never said anything about that. Uh, it's it feels like every year there's a top prospect that we expect is going to do an Eli Manning, even though no one's done that since 2004, and before that it was 1983. So you know we, we've got about 10 more years before we're on schedule for another prospect to say I don't want to go to to such and such team. But I think. I think it's a little bit of lazy, but also it is, it's engaging. It's, yeah. it's engaging for some of these accounts to get on X or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok and say, Caleb Williams doesn't want to be a bear. And as long as Caleb doesn't immediately push back on that, they've got days worth of engagement and, and that now equals money and a lot of attention. Was Caleb Williams a better prospect last year? I don't think so. Uh, you know what? Uh, maybe I'm an outlier here. I actually like that he battled some adversity this year because having watched him, you know, come into the halftime of the Red River game and beat Texas, the comeback to beat Texas. He's riding this high. You go to USC, you follow your coach like something out of any given Sunday, you know, Willie Beeman following Al Pacino to the new franchise, and they have this magical Heisman year. I like that he came back this year on a really bad USC team and had to, had to face some adversity for the first time as a college player. That actually helps me in my evaluation. I know it helps NFL teams as well because – you're not going to get drafted to a team that's going to be great. You're going to have to carry that team. There's going to be bumps and bruises. This season, I think, showed that he's capable of doing that. He is, at times, an emotional young man. He was 21 years old. I, I think that's you know to be expected. He saw his college dreams ending in some of those games that they expected to win. But he had to learn how to lose and how to learn how to carry a team and, and keep that culture intact despite a season with five losses. And I understand what he's saying yesterday. He doesn't need to commit to the Bears if the Bears aren't committing to him. And leaving open the pot. You don't want to say all these nice things about, hey, I want to be a Chicago Bear, and next thing you know, Washington's traded up to get him. What would the package be if Washington wants to go up, in your opinion? It's a, it's a lot because you're paying a premium because we all know that there's this one special player. So it's not your normal, let's swip, you know, switch two places like Chicago and San Francisco did a couple of years ago. I think it starts with a first round pick next year. So 2025 first round pick. I, if I were the Chicago bears, I would do a lot like what I did last year with the Carolina Panthers. I'm going to ask for a 2025 first. I'm going to ask for a defensive tackle, Jonathan Allen, who has already said, I'm not here for another rebuild. The bears have a massive need, a defensive tackle. And then I think you can say, all right, we want, we would like a third round pick in 2024 as well, because Ryan Poles has all the, once again, has all the leverage. He has all the control. He can say, no, we love Caleb Williams. We'll draft him right here. I think what might complicate matters is Jaden Daniels from LSU is a player that is really, really talented in his own right. So for Poles and the Bears, they might not have as much leverage as we think because Jaden Daniels isn't as much of a drop-off from Caleb Williams as we may have expected when this season started back in August. So now if you're Washington, 
you might even be able to argue, well, you know, we'll stay at two and take Jaden Daniel. So maybe you can, you can each stand in your corner and, and fight it out a little bit to where you don't have to give up as much. But I think a premium player and a first round pick is where you start. We're talking to Matt Miller, ESPN NFL draft analyst. Why are reviews on Drake Mave so varied? Yeah, I think beauty is an eye of the beholder. And if you look at Drake May, you see, oh my gosh, this is Josh Allen. This is Justin Herbert. He's six foot four. He's 230 pounds and he's mobile. Those are the things that get you really excited. I think what has happened, and, and I, I do this as well. We are largely one person scouting departments when you work in the media. So you're playing catch up a lot of the time. Once a guy declares for the draft, you, you start to play catch up and we have these pockets of time to do that. So for me personally, the more I've been able to watch Drake, the more some things bother me. You know, the processing speed is not always great. And I think that is one red flag with quarterbacks who've come out the past five, six years when they haven't had early success, it's processing speed. You know, we could say that about Justin Fields, who there are times Justin looks fantastic. There are other times you have no idea what's going on. And I think Drake May is really similar in that regard. Well, not being as fast as Justin, not as accomplished as a runner, but you see some of the deer in the headlights things at times, especially, you know, teams are sending free rushers at Drake May, and he, he doesn't have an answer for that a lot of the time. So he's going to need a little more coaching and development than I, I think he was billed as, especially after that great season last year, 2022. They struggled a little bit more this year with a new scheme. He lost Josh Downs until they got Tez Walker, who was you know late because of NCAA rules. That, that offense just looked disjointed, and I, I, it definitely affected his game. Yeah, he didn't lift the team up. And that's, you know, he regressed a little bit. And that happens a lot because you you can have a great year and then you come back. You know, Matt Leiner did this. I mean, it, it's the uh, college football is littered with these quarterbacks who came back. Uh, and then sometimes you go, OK, they're not as good as they were. And as you mentioned, Caleb Williams kind of battled through adversities. So he showed you something. I just didn't see anything when I watched Drake May where I went, Wow. And if I'm well, Washington, yeah. I'm, I'm not taking a chance. If I'm New England, I'm, I'm not taking a chance on that because I got a developmental guy instead of I got somebody who's going to play right away. I said this last night on SportsCenter, and I think everyone laughed at me. I would not take Drake May if I was the New England Patriots. They do not have the infrastructure for a developmental quarterback, like you just said. You don't have a left tackle. You don't have a wide receiver. You, we don't even really know what this regime is going to look like right now. Everything is new. I don't think this is the year to draft a quarterback. And you hear the arguments, you may never be up here again. That that might be true. I've looked at that roster. I feel pretty good that they're going to be drafted early <laughs> again. I don't. I think we're we're comfortable in 2025, yeah. New England. You're going to be up there again. So I, I'm with you. I think you know Drake is someone where it would be ideal for him to go somewhere. I, I think where there's either much better infrastructure or where there's not going to be that immediate pressure. You know, he won't last to the Minnesota Vikings, but that would be such a great opportunity for him to sit by and Kirk Cousins for one year and then be ready to go. So maybe Minnesota comes up to get a player like that, but I think that's the ideal situation for him. Help me understand the fascination with JJ McCarthy. Yeah, teams love the, you know, the spunkiness that's there, the toughness. It's all the things off the field, Dan. It's never, hey, let's watch the Alabama game together and we're going to watch him tear apart this defense. It's more of he's tough, he's smart, he's athletic. I, I think the way in for him is actually going to be much more interesting than, than people have realized. He's probably not going to be six foot three. I think it might be a struggle to be 200 pounds. He's not a big guy. He does have a good arm. He does have good mobility, but it's a lot of the unknowns. And I'll never forget being told by a general manager pretty early in my career that we love people who haven't failed yet. You know, and so JJ McCarthy doesn't have that one bad game out there. There might be a game like Penn State where he didn't throw in the second half. But he doesn't have that bad game that you can kind of, like we're doing with Drake May, you know, hanging your hat on some of the struggles that he's had. J.J. was really protected at Michigan. And so it is. It's a great unknown. Yeah. Uh, this guy was 26-1 and one in college, won a national championship, carried his team, wasn't always asked to do a lot. So it is, it is really a great mystery. Yeah, I don't know if he carried his team because they were a running team and a great defensive team. That that's yeah. really what carried them. That that's why you know I know previous year against Ohio State he looked great, but I it feels like Denver and Sean Payton are in love with JJ McCarthy or a lot of these mocks, and I'm going okay. Like I don't see it, and he might be great. I just I keep waiting to go. That's okay. Now I got it. Now I understand it. And then there's Bo Nix. Like Bo Nix was supposed to be something at Auburn, and then he ends up at Oregon and had an unbelievable year. Unbelievable season. 
I don't know what, you know, the draft experts and teams think about him. If, if you know, you're going, okay, is that an aberration here or is he building and, you know, adding to his arsenal here? Yeah, Bill Walsh used to have, I, I've read his book 40 times probably. It has this line that with quarterbacks, if he could see them do it a couple times, he knew he could coach them and get that consistently. That's what you're hoping with Bo Nix is that you have that, that coach there that can say, we can get the last two years at Oregon out of you. And I, I do think... He will be a starter rookie year. He, he played 61 games in college. He is arguably the most pro-ready quarterback in this draft. However, he doesn't have the arm strength of Drake May. He doesn't have the mobility of Jaden Daniels. He has good arm strength and he has good mobility. A, a lot of what they did at Oregon was deep shot or play the sideline. And so what that's what, what I have to see, and that's why this week's important. I would like to see him throw on time over the middle. I would like to see him layer the ball you know, into some pockets that are going to have to be there in the NFL, especially where you can't just play the hashes like they did in college at Oregon. So, you know, he is, it's a great story. You know, the struggles at Auburn where he was really, you know, tabbed is this next great thing. You go to Oregon and and revitalize your career. You know, I'd like to give him credit for that, for sticking with it and for persevering and becoming a better player. But, you know, with McCarthy and Nick, Stan, this is where like rankings of how we actually watch guys and rank them versus where they are in mock drafts. You know, you're going to have, JJ in the 20s, Knicks in the 30s or 40s, but you're thinking they're going to get drafted somewhere in the teens because someone's going to fall in love with the intangible. Someone's going to fall in love with the fact that, that it's it's that or Aiden O'Connell. You know, it's that or Drew Locke. What do, you, what do you do at the quarterback position? So I think that's why we'll see those guys drafted a lot higher than where we actually rank them. And you think Bo Nix starts as a rookie? I do. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I don't want to say if he goes to the Vikings, he's not going to unseat Kirk Cousins, but – you know, like the Giants in the second round, they have two second round picks. If he makes it to the Giants in round two, I think he fits what Brian Dable wants to do. Yeah, I think he could beat out Daniel Jones. I feel better about that. But, you know, some of this matters on situation. Yeah, he's uh, 24. The uh, receiving core, once again, it feels like you got uh, at least two, maybe three plug and play high draft picks here. Uh, assess what we're going to see in the top 10, top 15. Yeah, I think we'll see three receivers in the top seven picks. Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors. They, they could honestly, they could go four, five, six. They are that talented. They could fly off the board right after the quarterbacks do. Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU is right there in the mix as well. Not in, Maybe not in the top seven or eight, but he could be drafted in the early teens. Led the nation with 17 touchdown catches last year. He was Jaden Daniels' deep threat. He was the guy with the, the speed running vertically. He's got great body control, great length to pull in some of those deep passes, but it, it does feel like every year we're saying historically deep wide receiver class. And here we are again. But I think this time it might actually be true. You know, a Marvin Harrison Jr. is a, a rare enough prospect that he doesn't have to work out at the combine and he doesn't have to have a pro day. and He can still be a top three pick. He's he's that special as a player. And neighbors in a dunes, they were absolutely unstoppable the last two years. And they also, you know, have the resumes that uh, Malik neighbors won't be running at the combine. Roma Dunze, as of now, will be. And he has a, you know, he's got a chance to do what CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson did last year, which is say, all right, top guy's not working out. I'll do it. I'm not afraid to work out. And I'll make someone fall in love with me because I am the best player here who's actually performing. Any new combine jargon, uh, oily hips, waist bender, <laughs> anything we need to be aware of? Not yet, but the workouts start this afternoon. So I will report back with what the new, the new hot phrase is. And, and when are when do the hand measurements for quarterbacks come in just so I can, you know, break into coverage here on our program? Yeah, it should be tomorrow morning, oh, I believe. I remember last gosh. year, okay. Adam Schefter and I texting back and forth waiting for the Bryce Young weigh in. So I think it's Friday around noon is when that should come out. <laughs> uh, have fun there, Matt. Always great to talk to you. Likewise. Thanks, guys. And that's uh, Matt Miller. He's ESPN NFL draft expert, analyst. And his top 50 prospects list just came out this week on ESPN.com.